I'm Paul Levinson, and welcome to Light On, Light Through, episode 176, two reviews of Decades Apart. Well, let's go back to last year, literally just about a year ago, May 2020, when I came across a hidden little treasure on Amazon Prime Video. Now, I mean literally little, as in a short to very short time travel movie. That movie was entitled Decades Apart. It was about 20 minutes long. It was made in 2018, and it's the story of a phone call made by Diane in 1953 that unintentionally reaches Nathan in 2018. A tender, charming, understandably awkward conversation ensues, and that's pretty much the movie. Well, there is a little more. When Diane runs out of coins to feed the telephone in the train station that she's in in 1953 and has long been abandoned in 2018, Nathan rushes to what's left of the station to see her. A desperate attempt to put a real flesh-and-blood human being in the place of just the voice that he has been talking to. Well, I won't tell you how that works out. But I will say that the strength of this movie is indeed that tender, touching conversation. And the two cellos, performed by a group called Two Cellos, which provide the musical accompaniment. Deborah Hahn is fine as Diane and Martin Taliki as Nathan. The telephone, by the way, as an extrasensory, even extra-dimensional instrument is something that goes back to the beginning of the 20th century. You know, the telephone was invented by Alexander Graham Bell in 1876. So when we talk about the beginning of the 20th century, we're saying about 25 years after the telephone was invented. And that sense of magic, that almost extra-dimensional, extraordinary, what we would today call science-fictional sense, you saw that and heard that on postcards and in music. And that was the part of Decades Apart that I liked best. Now, you know, it's interesting to think about the fact we take the telephone and what it can do today for granted, but the telephone was something that people most appropriately thought was absolutely an incredible, miraculous invention. And as I say, appropriately, because before 1876, there was no way two human beings could have a conversation. No way they could have a conversation unless the person that you were trying to have a conversation with was in the same place as you, in the same room, or if you were standing outside, standing pretty much next to you. And shouting distance, that is the limit that someone could raise his or her voice, and hearing distance, that is the capacity of the person that you were hoping to talk to, to hear your voice, Those two variables, the strength of the voice and the strength of the ear, that was pretty much the limit in which conversations could take place. But the telephone changed all that, and people were just thrilled about that. They thought correctly that it was a miracle. You were in the Bronx. You had a girlfriend in Brooklyn. You could pick up the phone and talk to her. And pretty soon you could do that if you were in the Bronx and your girlfriend was in Boston. And not long after that, you could do that uh, if you were in New York and somebody you wanted to talk to was in London, etc., etc. It was a real miracle. And the postcards, as I said, and music of that time captured that miracle just beautifully. 
Uh, you'll see uh, in the show notes to this episode a picture of one of many pieces of sheet music and postcards that I have because I collect these. I find them so interesting. This is the cover of the sheet music to a song written by Charles K. Harris. And it says on this cover that he's also the songwriter of After the Ball. I don't know if I ever heard of that song, After the Ball, but I certainly have heard of Hello Central, Give Me Heaven, because it's one of many songs that play on this magical capacity that the telephone has to allow people to talk to other people even though they're not physically in the same place. It parlays that into a fantasy that you could talk to someone who's not even on this planet Earth. And I don't mean just out in space, which of course they didn't have back at the beginning of the 20th century either. Hello Central, give me heaven. Uh, the person uh, who's asking Central to give him or her heaven is actually a little child wanting to speak to a departed parent, I guess. Well, that was something that people easily could imagine. Maybe, who knows, on a good day the telephone could do. That's how miraculous it was in reality. And I thought Decades Apart really captured that magic of the phone just beautifully. It was not a perfect movie. No movie is. There were a few, let's call them temporal clunkers in the dialogue. For example, Diane protests that she's not a, quote, telemarketer, unquote. That term didn't come into common use, of course, until the 1970s. So what is Diane doing saying that in 1953? And the two, Diane and Nathan, talk about landlines. But that term didn't come into use until the 1980s and later when mobile phones began to become massively popular. But I still found this little movie massively worth watching. And last year I gave kudos to Andrew DePardo and writers Andrew DePardo and Gilbert T. LeBurge for making this little gem. And I said I looked forward to seeing more of their work. But you know what? I never imagined that a little less than a year later I would not only be seeing more of their work, but more of their work in this same little movie. Because just a few days ago, there came along a director's cut of this same movie, Decades Apart. I think of it as worth keeping even closer because it said things to me that I didn't hear in the original movie, which I'll explain in a moment. You know, it's rare, very rare, that I review a 20-minute movie, and even more rare, as in never before, that I review a director's cut of a movie that I've seen and reviewed before. But you, my loyal listeners of this podcast, know that I can almost never resist a time travel narrative. And seeing as how I enjoyed Decades Apart last year, you just heard my review, so you know how much I enjoyed it. I just couldn't resist the brand new noir cut, as Andrew DePardo calls his director's cut, of this little movie. So I just told you what the story is. It's about a phone call from a train station in 1953 that lands in a home in 2018. The caller is Diane, the receiver is Nathan, who takes the call on the landline kept in the house for his grandmother. I thought that was a nice touch. And as I said, the conversation is savvy, tender, deep, and endearing. But you know, it also occurred to me as I was watching this new cut that the story of a possible couple who get to know each other only through the phone, separated not by miles but something much more impenetrable, decades, 
That has a special relevance, doesn't it, to our own pandemic times, perhaps now just beginning to come to an end as more and more of us get vaccinated after more than a year in which the only way most of us could relate to each other, unless we were already living together, was via Zoom or a similar app. So at the end of this short film, when Nathan rushes over to the train station to finally see and with any luck embrace Diane, they find they can't talk to each other and see each other, but their hands, as they reach out to touch, are separated by some temporal barrier far more potent than social distancing. And, you know, I realized as I was seeing this director's cut that that really is not only a good metaphor for what we've been going through in this past year of the pandemic, but it's really a good metaphor for life anytime in which we are always trying to establish a better connection with human beings that we've come to care about. And... As we all know, it's not easy. Things get in the way all the time. And the temporal barrier is just that thing that gets in the way of us having a special relationship with people. The time barrier is really just that barrier writ large. Because it's really incredibly obvious that you can't communicate in a way that allows you to hold and touch someone through time. That's pretty obvious in a way that it often is not obvious, even though it's equally real, in fact, more real, because that's what life is in our real world. And, you know, the phone is a good way of getting at that, because the old-fashioned phone, as media theorists including me as a doctoral student, realized back in the 1970s, is a profoundly personal, even intimate instrument in which the speaker's mouth goes right into the listener's ear. That's much more personal all the time than a Zoom or any video conversation usually is. So because of that, Diane and Nathan already have a lot going for them. By being able to talk on the phone through time, they are within intimate distance of each other, even though they can never hold each other or touch each other. And there's that power in this director's cut, as in the pre-pandemic original, the power that stems from this profoundly personal telephonic connection. And it's a power that makes you just believe that maybe Diane could be talking to the future and Nathan to the past. It's what I had in mind when I wrote this song, If I Traveled to the Past. I travel to the past to change your mind So you love me then and you love me now Would I have known to travel back in the first place If I traveled back so fast that the world was blind Could I slip through time, could I slip the vine A paradox that turns the best into the worst case If I traveled to the past to change 
Actually, I wrote the lyrics to that song, and I gave them to John and Neilio, who wrote the music. That was back in 2010. I recorded it up at Old Bear Studios in Batavia, New York, for Old Bear Records in late 2018. And they released that song, with seven other songs in an album called Welcome Up Songs and Space and Time that I recorded back then. And by the way, my first record album was called Twice Upon a Rhyme. So there was a temporal element in that. That came out in 1972. So I waited almost 50 years to come up with a second album. Welcome Up Songs and Space and Time, which has that song, If I Travel to the Past. Obear Records released it on CD and digitally, and Light in the Attic Records released it on multi-colored vinyl. All of that was in early 2020. And that sense of if I travel to the past, that's what I had in mind in every time travel and short story I've ever written. And it's certainly what is conveyed in decades apart, both versions. By the way, Deborah Hahn was good again as Diane and Martin Taliki as Nathan. Of course they were because you're seeing the exact same performance in this noir cut as in the original. That original, by the way, is still on Amazon. And I saw the new noir director's cut on YouTube. I have no idea if that link will work for you or how long. But with any luck, you won't have to travel too far into the future to see it. The Light on Light Through podcast. Well, I hope you enjoyed that double review of Decades Apart. This is part of my continuing Saturday presentation of a review to you on Light On, Light Through. Every Saturday, I'll review either a science fiction movie or a television series or a mystery movie or television series. I'll sometimes sneak that in. By the way, you know, mysteries and science fiction do have a lot in common. Mystery detective stories are whodunits. Science fiction is something that's a what done it. And the only difference between a who done it and a what done it is the O in the who is translated into an AT in the what. And again, I thought Decades Apart was a really good what done it little movie. So I'll be back here next week, next Saturday, with a review of another science fiction movie or television series or a mystery movie or television series. Who knows, maybe during the week I'll come in with some kind of political commentary. We'll see. You never know what you're going to get on Light On, Light Through. In the meantime, hey, reach out and touch somebody. Stay safe. Stay sound. And enjoy. Athens, 
2042 AD. She ripped the paper in half, then ripped the halves, then ripped what was left again into bits and pieces of history that could have been. Sierra Waters had read once that, years ago, it was thought that men made love for the thrill, while women made love for the sense of connection it gave them. Curled up with a good book says, Sierra Waters is sexy as hell. You can find out more about The Plot to Save Socrates by Paul Levinson at theplottosavesocrates.com. about an ancient biotech war raging on in secret for centuries.